Okay. So I'm going to introduce Rocky Lang. And Rocky's been a friend of mine for a while now. And Rocky um, is a film and TV producer. And we met through my husband uh, through tennis, and we've become very good friends. So Rocky, take it away. Okay. Nice to meet everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Um, by the way, ha have you all read this amazing magazine, Bedside yeah. Reasoning Presents Books to Screen? <laughs> because it's in that it's in that magazine that I was introduced to Grace Blair, who will who will guest star later in this in this show um, for her book Einstein's Compass, which we're now um, in the midst of trying to package to Hollywood. And so, uh, thank you, Jane, for that introduction. Appreciate it. Um, thank you. Um, I've had a, a long career in the film business and, the, and then also in the book business. I've had uh, nine, ten books published, including one bestseller, and made you know movies and television and miniseries and movies of the week. And recently, I've uh, found great enjoyment of of shepherding and helping authors um, sort of traverse a very dangerous and precarious climate here in Hollywood. It's really the the, the worst climate I've ever seen. Um, and I, I don't need to get too into it, but there's a lot of reaction going on to the world around us, and it's affecting what they're looking for and 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 what's getting made on the air. Wait, excuse me, Rocky. I'm just going to ask. I'm going to mute everybody, and then I'm going to um, unmute you, Rocky. Okay. And or Rocky, can you unmute yourself? Did no one hear that? Okay, I heard it. Did everybody hear what I was saying? Cool. Okay, great. Okay, good. Okay, so thanks for coming. Um, anyway, so uh, what we're going to do today is I'm going to walk you through a, a short, uh, medium short PowerPoint um, of what I put together. And then we'll do like a bunch of questions and answers. And I'm going to ask Grace to come on and talk about her experience. So with that said, I'm going to, I'm going to um, share my screen. All right, so I got to go. Here's the disclaimer, guys. Getting anything made in Hollywood takes a Herculean effort, great material, and a shitload of luck. Um, plan to share with you the tools I use when I pitch projects, but in no way do they guarantee any success. And I just say this to everybody because there's a misconception in Hollywood about how easy it is to get in or there's, there's secret ways to get in. And I'm just going to share with you what I do. So if we look at Hollywood today, it's in constant need of existing material and IP is king. And this is very cool because uh, this is a very positive thing is that for some reason, studio executives and buyers are very interested in IP more so than an original idea. So uh, if the idea comes in in a book form or in an article or in some way like that, you know, it's it's very positive. Um, it's a good it's a good thing. And you all have books, which is excellent. There's a word that is going around Hollywood and has been going around for some time. It's called branded content. And it's actually um, for those of us who are who face blank pages and create things that uh, never existed before. It's it's our our big bad. This is what we're competing against. This is this is these are the movies that have been made time and time again. They're Marvel Comics, DC Comics. You know the big, big films that um, are called branded content, and so in the old days, um, you know, an idea could come to the top if it was really good. Now you're fighting this branded content world out there, which is pretty tough. Out there in Hollywood, we're seeing sequels and remakes again, branded content. This is to me like the most ridiculous of all. It's Friday the Thirteenth and all of its aftermaths, or its, its sons, and they keep turning. And just when you think it's over, there's a, um, you know, a final chapter, and it really never is the final chapter. But then we get into books, and, it, and um, there have been always been a lot of books in Hollywood. I mean, I'm just actually reading Rebecca right now, which was turned into the great Selznick movie that uh, Hitchcock directed back in the day, and and that's you know found a new world all these years later. Anyway, these books are all turned into movies, which is pretty cool. And in 2022, because I haven't really updated this right now, there are an awful lot of books that were turned into movies, including many books that became Academy Award nominees. Um, 
this was a this the recent adaptions of books right now but this is an interesting story because this is a book called a man called ove which nobody ever really heard of it was nothing but it was a wonderful book and it got made I, I think it was made in denmark and if you see the movie that hanks is out now i forgot the name of it, a man called i don't know what it's called joe um if you go back if you look at this film this is a wonderful film and, and nobody ever saw it but it, it came from a book and was made into a foreign film and now is a Tom Hanks film. So like one of the things I'm going to talk to you about with Grace later on is that you, going overseas is sometimes a way to get back to the United States. So how do you access Hollywood? How are you going to uh, get producers interested in your book? And get your book turned into a script. So synthesizing material is a way to attract an agent, publisher, or producer, and this includes logline, synopsis, lookbooks, and sizzle reels. Some of you may be familiar with these terms, some of you may not be, and I hope to explain them. I'm going to go into a use study here. I've been you've been hearing me talking about um, about Grace, and I saw Grace's uh, book in, in Jane's magazine, and it fascinated me because it's a um, historical fantasy. It's an interesting genre, and I felt that there was something really unique about the story. Um, there is a spiritual element to it. There's a lot of action in it. It was young, so demographically, it could work in a lot of ways. And so um, I contacted Grace, and we made an agreement, an option on the book. And right now, there's a good good amount of, of heat on it. I mean, there's a very important producer attached. We've got an agent here in the United States, an agent in, over in England, uh, working to put this to the next step. So... You can see her log line, um, when young Albert Einstein's father gives him a jeweled compass, he has no idea of the adventure that awaits, spanning from 10,400 BCE on the island of Poseidon to Switzerland in 1903. Einstein's compass sweeps across dimensions, all while Albert Einstein is growing into his destiny. But a dangerous creature hunts Albert and the compass. In this fantasy adventure, cosmic forces of good and evil clash around the budding scientist on the cusp of his greatest discovery. So if you start, if we start to dissect this this log line, which is really a series of sentences, which is fine, um, it communicates not only a tone of what this movie does, but teases action, teases adventure, te teases growth, um, and so all of those things are really attractive because as a producer you can go, okay, how can I program this into what is happening right now, and because it has these elements in it, it becomes at least something that we're willing to roll the dice on and see what, what happens. I'm going to run you now um, a new share of the sizzle reel that we put together. Albert Einstein became one of the greatest minds of the 20th century because he had a dream. And no matter the bullying, family leaving him, teachers not supporting him, he never lost his vision to know what time and light is. I know, because as a child, Albert and I became best friends. My name is Johann Thomas. Albert's quest began when we discovered his compass was supernatural. Then his compass started to put us both in danger. A shape-shifting dragon named Rocco longed for the compass and had me killed. Then. I woke up in heaven with angels. Supernatural beings asked me to be Albert's guardian angel to help Albert fight the darkness. We traveled back through time to Atlantis to meet the dragon's brother, Arca. We discovered Albert's soul was from Arca, a brilliant priest scientist. Arca warned Albert of his brother's lust for power and how to protect Albert with his compass. He found his dream and discovered time, light, and relativity. The compass helped forge Albert's destiny. His life was a thrilling ride of adventure through time and multiple dimensions of light.
Okay, so um, that is Einstein's compass, and we can talk a little bit later about how sizzle rules were made and 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 what goes on. But it it, it we didn't shoot anything there. That that material is all existing from other movies uh, put together by a brilliant editor that I used named Freddie Noriega and Grace. Um, so why don't you tell everybody about this process about when we first talked about your book and what your hopes and dreams were and sort of like how our interaction went and then how it went with Freddie and where we are now. And Grace has to unmute herself. Oh, right. Okay. Well, thank you, Rocky. Um, it actually came through Jane initially. Um, I put my book in her AI program which tells us whether or not a book could be theatrically good. And out of 100, it came out to be 89.7. So Jane got all excited and had Rocky uh, contact me to see if we could possibly create something from the book. And I knew from the beginning I started writing this book that it was going to be in, the, in a movie or in a television series. I just knew it. And I just kept making materials like storyboards and all kinds of materials so that when I finally got to meet somebody like Rocky, I would just send him the stuff and then we would get this done. And that's basically what's what's happened. I mean, the two of us talked on um, Zoom, we had a meeting and within 20 minutes, we knew that we were gonna work together. And he's been really great and keeping me informed as far as what he's been doing to try to get the book uh, out there. He knows everybody in the world. Um, I, like that. I know Jane. You know Jane. <laughs> uh, um, so now it's across the pond um, with a literary agent in England who's um, helping us get into Germany. And I think it would be awesome to get it into Germany because the story itself is in Einstein's hometown of Munich. And the people there would just go crazy if they could be part of this movie in that town. I know it. Um, and just walking through the book itself, it's I'm just surprised I'm here. OK, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed. And working with Freddie uh, to get the sizzle reel done. Well, I thought, you know, Rocky said, well, Freddie's going to make this nice two minute uh, trailer. I go, good. OK, I don't have to do anything. No. Now, Rocky says, no, you're going to do it. You, we want you to produce it. We want you to write the script. We want you to do it. I go, whoa. So I, I, I got into this Learjet of producer world in Hollywood and started working with this fabulous person, Freddie, who um, knows so much about making film. And he made it very easy for me. He told me how long the script had to be, how many words. And he wanted it from the point of view of one of the characters. And I chose um, Einstein's best friend in the book, who I created, Johan, because um, having read The Gatsby, The Great Gatsby, you don't hear Gatsby talking about himself. You hear his neighbor talking about him because he's such a huge character. And so I used Johan as the person to actually introduce the story and to write about this great scientist who has changed the world. Um, to me, the, the book is about dreams and about making helping your dreams come true no matter what you've gone through. And young Albert Einstein went through it. I mean, he really did. And so I, I take his story um, and with the help of Freddie, I mean, he was amazing. And I was so excited for like two weeks, we're running, going back and forth through emails and. Uh, the things that he needed and what I needed to get, you know, make him um, aware of and what he needed to make me aware of. It was, it was just, it was like really wonderful working together. It was so easy. Um, and I had a great time doing it. It was so much fun. Uh, I can't, and Freddie told me, he said, this is the, one of the best sizzle reels he's ever made. Maybe he tells that to everybody. I don't know. But he said that no, it's really it's it's an excellent it's an excellent piece and it, it served us well. And everybody, um, we'll talk a little bit more about this. But the, the beauty of the sizzle reel um, is so, you know, all of you for the most or for the most part, most of you are self-published authors. Um, and 
which is in the old days was a was a sort of blight. In today's world, no, it's not. I mean, look at the number number of books have, have found their way through from uh, authors who have not published with big houses. But the sizzle reel um, is a fantastic door opener, and because you, you're not asking somebody to read a 300 page uh, book, you're you're asking them to watch a two minute sizzle reel with the hope that they will become interested in reading your book. But I'll get more into this uh, in a moment. Grace, anything else you want to say before I, I move on down the road? All I can say is um, if you're if you put your book in the AI program that Jane has and it registers 70 or above, you really need to talk to Rocky. Okie dokie. Thanks, Grace. Into this. So Thanks. Phantom Rescue um, is, is a project that is sort of on its, its, unfortunately, on its last breath, which gets back to the first slide, even with an amazing package, an amazing sizzle reel, an amazing team. It, sometimes it doesn't work. And so you put all this effort into something and you do everything right and it doesn't work. But it doesn't mean it doesn't, it doesn't work forever. I mean, I, I made a movie three years ago that I tried to sell 10 years ago. And I couldn't sell it and I sold it three years ago and it got made. So in Hollywood, things come around again. So anyway, Phantom Rescue um, is based on a, on a true family. Um, and I'm going to show you the sizzle reel now. I they can and you will never see it coming for them it's a transaction while you live in denial they're watching waiting and there's nothing you can do about it but if you want it back your stuff your people your assets if you're willing to do what's necessary you'll call someone like me my name is Visek Phantom Rescue is my company. It's a family business. We put Warcraft to work for insurance companies, corporations, the government, one percenters. If you want your ship back, your yacht, your jet, your CEO, we will scour the earth. We are the storm, but it's going to cost you. We get paid a lot, but that's not why we do it for the money. We do it to deal with this. 50 children are abducted in this country every day. Children like yours. Most end up in Asia, Eastern Europe, South America, the Middle East. The human sex trade is 20 million strong. 13 million are kids and most are never found. I was one of the lucky ones. It isn't safe because they are coming like a plague. But there is hope. We're here. If you lose a child, our services will cost you nothing. Just don't ask us how we do it. I promise you won't like the answer. So that's that's an amazing that's an amazing reel, and it's based on a real group of people who actually do this. And um, we're still we're we're alive, but we're we're we've been shot down by a lot of places um, uh, on this. Uh, but it's got it's opened a lot of doors. I mean, I sent it to Ridley Scott, and you know he he called us in, and we had a great meeting with Ridley, and you know ultimately they passed because they had another project in the sort of the same area that it, you know was more advanced you hear that a lot in in nice passes but um in any event it, it you can tell from the sizzle that what the show is i mean it really it really you don't need a lot of uh imagination which is part of the reason of the sizzle because i believe that most studio executives have the attention span of a gnat and if you can sizzle them if you can get a Get them excited about seeing the the material that is below that, whether or not it's a script or it's a, a book or it's something else that 
the, the sizzle is derived from, then you're into a conversation. And that's all you want to do. You want to get in the door and have the conversation. I, okay, I'm going to so, jump in for a second. Rocky, the, I think the point is, though, you sent the sizzle reel to Ridley Scott. And he might not have taken a meeting had it just been a normal meeting with a pitch. But you sent it to the, the video to his executives, and he was able to get a meeting. And I think that's the point, is that the sizzle reel opened that door again. Even though he knew you, it, but you hadn't spoken to him in a while, it reopened that door. Yeah, it was at Ridley and I, Ridley and I made a movie together 10 years ago, no more, 20 years ago. Wow. Uh, and so I, you know, I'd been loosely in touch with him for over the years, but not, you know, not in a, in a close way. And so this was a fantastic. I mean, he called me from London. He said, oh, my God, this, this is great. He says, you guys didn't go out and shoot all this, did you? I said, no, no, it's all from other material. It didn't cost us that much. And so he says, well, this is great. I'm coming back to the States. Let's let's get together. So I, I went in with my write, my writing partner Todd and um, and had a wonderful meeting and you know which is great to see Ridley but it, it didn't turn out to anything which is what happens most of the time unfortunately in this business. If you, um, anyway, with that said, let's let's move on to uh, the, the the deck and um, let's see Jane if we're going to have to do our little uh, our little our dance. But I think the sizzle reel is really what makes it happen because it's video. They're comfortable with video. And, you know, as Rocky has said, and I agree with him on so many levels that, you know, when you're somebody pitches you a project, you then as the executive have to repitch it to, to your bosses and people do not have a good memory. They remember things completely differently. So if you have a video, you can actually that's two minutes long. You can actually show that to your bosses. And that way, you know, you're being actually, you know, true to the project and having to rely on your memory okay okay so la gringa i just want you to show show you something la gringa is a completely different approach to sizzle reel making and some people um some people have come to me and they want to actually demonstrate what the show is going to look like so they've gone out and shot a couple of scenes or a trailer and so this this is going to look a lot different than what you saw from Freddie. It takes a little bit more creativity. It takes more collaboration, but some people are capable of doing that. And so with that um, said, let me let me give this a shot here. Right. Okay. So we're going to just look at Phantom Rescue um, as as a a lookbook. Now, what the lookbook is, it's a less expensive way of of synthesizing your material in a visual way. Um, I use everything. I use the I lose a lookbook. I use a sizzle reel. I use the log lines. I use everything I can possibly use. And th this lookbook that I'm going to show you br briefly, I'll go through it quickly. Um, there's sort of three ways you can do it. One is an introduction, so you you know float it into an agent and they they get excited about it. You can use it as a leave behind after you've had your pitch, um, or you can actually use it during your pitch and sort of as as supplemental material. So you, you show your team, this is something we did with uh, Mark Harmon, Todd Robinson's an Emmy award-winning director. Um, and uh, you sort of set it up, Phantom, what the I concept is, Phantom locates, recovers, and returns money, property, hostage, diplomats, and fugitives. Get paid a lot. The money is not why they do it. They do it of the, the, the exploited children. We talk about that it was um, inspired by true stories of this man, Tony Sparks. We get into the characters. We run through all the characters um, in in the show, the main characters, and then we get into the relationships and the arcs. And this was a sizzle reel. This was a lookbook that we did um, in conjunction with our verbal pitch. So, you know, this wouldn't fly by itself, but in conjunction with telling the story, it does. And then you get into really, it's a family show. Um, we show the sizzle reel here. We talk about the unshareable problem, which is really important in drama. Um, that Fisick was a guy who was trafficked with his sister and abused, and so that's what is driving him to do what he does now. We go through the arcs of the show. We go through the series of the various various episodes of the show, and that's that's um, in very quick terms a, a, what a sizzle reel is. I mean, uh, what a lookbook is. Okay, so we need a pitch, and if, and if anybody of you seen the, the the player, it's one of my favorite movies, and so I pull this little funny scene out for you, uh, which I just missed. I just eliminated. Okay. 
I got a writer in here who's got a pitch. I think you ought to hear everything you said. We open outside San Quentin. Congratulations. Part two. And Mrs. Robinson had a stroke, so she can't talk. It's going to be funny? Yeah, it'll be funny. Exactly right. It's half Africa meets pretty one way. Goes to the expansion in Canada. All right, so it's crazy. That's how pitches work. Okay, so log lines. Most of you know what log lines are, so I just put a few in here. The aging patriarch often organized. I can't read. I, my, it's being covered, but dynasty transfers control of his clandestine empire to his reluctant son. Anybody know what this movie is? Godfather. Okay. Great White Shark, Menace Small Island, Marine Scientist, Grizzly Fisherman, Set Out to Stop It, Jaws. Arrival in a mental institution, a rebel rallies the patients, one flew over the cuckoo's necks. So these are all like telling you um, just a log line to get people excited about it. Okay. So now that I have all this stuff, I don't know anyone. How do I get people to see my pitch package? Sizzles, well, sizzles can be compressed and put into the body of an email. And agents and production companies can be contacted to be found through IMDb Pro. So what I'm really saying right here is that even if you don't have any contacts, okay, because you've now got your sizzle reel in your lookbook and that you don't know anybody and you're going, okay, now Rocky, you made me do all this stuff. What do I do with it? The beauty of the sizzle reel is you can compress it into an, into an email. So, and you can get the phone numbers, emails, and addresses off of IMDb Pro, which is a subscription service you can get. So in the worst case scenario, if you don't have an entertainment attorney or a manager or an agent, what you can do is you can send these, be compressed into, a, into an email, you know, dear, let me go to the next one, like place. Okay, like right here, it's compressed into an email. You know, dear agencies, please take two minutes to watch the sizzle reel of my book. The best book in the world has received great reviews on Amazon. If you're interested, please contact me, your name, blah, 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 blah. So all that person has to do is click that, click, click right in your email and they get your two minute sizzle reel. If they like it, they call you up and they say, hey, this is really cool. What else do you have? Well, I have this book and it got all these awards and it did this, that, and the other. And they go, great. Can we see it? So the sizzle reel has now opened that door to you. And even the assistants on these desks are eager to find material because most of the assistants that are on the desks of the literary agents and the, and the packaging agents, they're there because they want to become agents. And so they are out there looking for material. So even if you can't get to the big, big, you can get to their, their, their assistant and their assistant can see it. If the assistant likes it, the assistant will then expose it to their boss. And now you're into a conversation. The beauty of the pitch, the sizzle reel and the deck is it can be used at every level. So you have your, let's say you're, you're, you're looking for an agent for your book. Okay, now your sizzle reel can be sent to an agent. Oh, wow, this is really great. Can I read your book? The lit agent can use a sizzle reel to try to find you a publishing deal. The lit agent can give, send it to a film agent. The film agent can give it to a producer. The producer can send it to the studio. So you're gonna have your log lines, your sizzle books, your look books. Ultimately, they're gonna go into the, to, uh, the studio's story department. It'll be covered there. It'll go to a creative executive. It'll go to a studio mo executive mo mogul, and then you're going to make a lot of money, right? That's the goal. So who are the buyers? Every production company and studio in town. There's the marketplace of the majors. You're all familiar with all of these, Metro, Golden Mayor, Fox, Paramount, Sony, Universal, Disney. These are the big guys. They do the big movies, but they all are looking for material. There are many majors, Focus, Foxers, like Miramax, the streamers, too many to even mention. TV, you guys know all of that. They're not all buying, but Lifetime, for instance, is really buying. They're looking, they're, they're doing like 200 movies a year. There's new media. These are short form content. Sometimes you may wanna make a little version, a little short of your, your piece and, and get it into a new media. And if it gets a lot of eyeballs, the studios start paying attention to it. But even with the sizzle of deck and a great book, the odds of success are very small. But if you want to be competitive, you need to have them. And that's what I tell everybody is like, if you're going to play in the big leagues, you need to be competitive. And that means you have to have the same tools that the people who are selling these movies and selling these television shows are using. And this is what I use. And this is what I've been successful with. And now I've sold a number of projects. So that's sort of how you get your books in the film. And with that, I just leave you with log lines. Synopsis are less important today, but they're still good. The lookbooks, also known as decks, the sizzle reels, and the virgin, the, the verbal pitches. And so that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of my presentation.
and I am more than happy to uh, take questions if you want to talk. And let me jump in. We do have a couple of questions. So just to go back, um, people, first of all, um, people are loving your sizzle reel. So that's great. Um, um, I see Christine Grant said, I love that you're creating the Phantom Rescue film. Human trafficking is such a huge topic. There needs to be as many movies surrounding this topic to wake everyone up. So, and thank you, uh, Christine. Jeannie says, hi, what is a deck? And what's the difference between a deck and a lookbook? Or is exactly it the same. It's just terminology. I'm sorry if I confused you. Um, as I was growing up, because I'm a dinosaur, just got my Medicare card, yay. Um, um, in the old days, we called them decks. So now they call them lookbooks. So right. I, I, I just use the old vernacular. Um, and Jeannie also asked, Rocky opened up by saying that it's harder than ever to sell in Hollywood. Can you please expand on that and why? Okay, so um, it's really complicated. And I think that part of the, the reason is that it's, it's so confusing is nobody knows. And um, I can give you some general ideas, um, but even just with meeting with agents last week, they were like, we don't even know what to pitch anymore. We, we can't sell anything. And part of it is the reaction to what we've been coming out to, of with, you know, coming out of Me Too and coming out of um, Black Lives Matter and coming out of a lot of a lot of focus on the industries um, taking advantage of situations, whether it's uh, who's the guy on uh, Kevin Spacey, you know, big actors using their power in order to sort of, you know, take what they want. And this is nothing new. I mean, you can go back you know, to Hollywood in the 30s and 40s and it was rampant. We hope we've evolved, but we clearly haven't. Power power makes people do interesting and strange things. And so right now, the networks and, and, and the buyers are looking a lot for authentic voices and non-appropriation. And so what that means, what does that mean? Okay, that means is like maybe in the old days, a uh, I could write a book about a woman protagonist um, I've raised three daughters, and I think I know women pretty well, and I think I understand how to write their 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 language. Um, if I wrote that, I might hear, you can't write that story because you're not a woman. It, it, it applies much more eth into ethnic worlds and or into the LBGTQ world. So a straight guy can't write that world, a black guy, a white guy can't write a black character, it's so forth and so on, because everybody's sort of running scared of how the world is going to view them. And, and, and so it's caused a lot of confusion as to, you know, what can be pitched and who is the originator of the content and how can it get in? And if they buy, if the content's really good, but if the wrong guy's involved with it, um, it, it could be a backfire. This to me is a reaction because Hollywood is very reactive. Um, the hope is, is that it'll all settle down in the next year or two and that, it will get back to sort of, you know, talent and material is what's most important. But right now, it's we're, we're living in that environment. The other thing that's happening right now, and it's been going on for a long time, is what I started with, is branded content. So um, if, if you have a, a proven formula, Batman, Superman, Ant-Man, Coffee Man, whatever you want to say, say it is, and that has proven to be successful over and over and over again, the studio executives can justify their choices to continue to be um, derivative of their past movies because one, it's a CVA, cover your ass, um, that, they, that no one's going to say, well, why did you make this movie when you could have made that movie? And the other thing is, is that oftentimes with these now multinational corporations, which have ownership of the studios and the, and the television networks, it's just a bottom line. So it's not like universal is just universal. Um, or, or Fox is just Fox, they are reporting to larger entities. And so they are less concerned with protecting the individual voice and more, more concerned with showing what their bottom lines are. So if they can make Batman 47 and be guaranteed that they're going to make a billion dollars on it, they would rather make Batman 47 than make this beautiful little movie for $12 million that is really special. And what tends to happen at Academy Award time is these really beautiful little special films that are often made independently or, or overseas, they find their way in and they win these awards because, and they're not the big tentpole movies 
the Batmans and the, and the, and the DC comic movies that are the ones that garner all the critical acclaim and the, the awards. And so as, an, as a self-published author without a New York Times number one bestseller, it makes the landscape all the more difficult to find the, the, the key, to get through the key to the castle because the key is very small and there are a lot of people trying to get into it. Um, and so the, that's why the landscape of Hollywood is more difficult. On, on the flip side of that, there's never been a time where there's been more, um, more content being produced because there are so many networks and streamers and buyers. The problem is, is what is being produced and what are they buying and who are they buying them from? So series are the way to go. And I tell all the authors who consult with me, if there's a way to turn your typical three act book that would normally go into a movie into a, a five or seven act pilot that can then turn into two seasons, you're going to have a better chance because the economic models are proving better in the series world than they are in the two hour world. And even it changes like so quickly, like just two years ago, um, there was a lot of limited series going on. So like, you know, Queen's Gambit, for example, which is very successful on a book that nobody knew, paid attention to the book written in 1980s. So like nobody's, it was not on anybody's like hot list and it was found and boom, it, it, it was very successful. So there were a lot of these like sort of eight hour, 10 hour uh, limited series, very expensive to make. And ultimately they looked at this and they said, you know, this model is not economically sound. You know, it, it's a one season show and we want to we want to try to get three, four five seasons out of this. And so therefore we need it to be open ended instead of closed ended. So um, uh, an author I've been working with um, who, who I met through Jane, um, she has three books. OK, and they're all sort of standalones in many respects. They could all be two, three, two hour movies, but the good thing about her book is that she used the same main character that appears in all the books, even though they're not connected. The first book sort of ends as an end. And so at least it's a way of like saying, what I said to her is, look, at if there's a way of connecting these stories and show that you're going to get at least three or four seasons out of this show, you know, we can, we can make a presentation to the studios that in, in the sizzle reel and everything else, that this is a three or four year, you know, series that can come out. So if they want to buy the concept and they like, you know, what you're, what you're trying to sell, then maybe there's a, there's a way to get in on that, even though her original intention was just three books that were standalones. So I'm always advising people to the best that I can that if you can find a way to do a series, great. And I'm also telling, I also try to tell people, which is very important, um, is to, um, is to be, realistic with the material that you have and what i'm saying what i mean by that is that and i've written nine books so i totally get it you know we're completely invested in our work you know and we write not only for ourselves but we write because we want to share what we have to say to the world and we want people to you know enjoy what we work or learn from our work impacted in by our work we want to get it out there and so not every book translates to media some of these books are best left as books. That's, and what's wrong with that? I mean, that's great. Not everybody has to go to Hollywood. And sometimes we have to look at our material and be honest with ourselves and say, yeah, you know what? I'm looking at the landscape. I'm seeing what the movies are being made. I'm looking at television. I see what Netflix is showing and Hulu's buying and all that. Where does my book fit? How could my book fit into this world? And if you see a way in and you feel an angle and you feel really strong about it, then by all means, if you have the energy and are willing to risk the time and the money to like sort of get the tools to get there, you know, go for it. Because I'm never going to be the one who says, don't do it. Don't follow your heart. Don't follow your dream. You know, never. I'm never going to be that person because I get it. I mean, I I fought many hard battles in my life, carried many, you know, tough projects on my back up mountains and I because I, I believed in them. And, you know, sometimes I got them made and most times I didn't. Um, but the effort was, I made a determination at some point that, that that was something that was worth my effort, knowing full well that my chances of success were limited. Because I could balance that out by the rest of my portfolio where I had more commercial projects. Um, so you need to be honest with yourself of, you know, what, what you have and, and if it's going to fit in the, into the next world. Um, I hope that was a long, that's a long-winded answer 
to giving you to what you asked about the landscape of Hollywood. Um, and if you want to know anything more about it, you know, give me a call. Uh, you know, else? So I just want to jump in a couple of things. So uh, Danny W has asked who pays for the sizzle reel, the author, and what's an average cost? Okay, well, I can answer that question. Well, Grace, you can answer that question in regard to you. Yeah. Because everybody else gets it for $100. You just had to pay $2,500 or $3,000. So. No, no, no. It was more than that. <laughs> well, what did yours wind up being? I don't know. I, I just pass, some, pass people on to Freddie. What, what did yours cost? I paid $3,000. Okay. That's about right. Say, one thing I would like to say, everything is going to video. All you see, the book trailer is going to YouTube. Everybody's pushing you uh, video. And all I can say is this is the best investment you are going to make in selling books. Those little videos on YouTube are nothing compared to what Freddie can do for you and what Rocky can do with it. Well, okay, that's very sweet. Grace, you're very special. I don't take on that many projects personally. Okay. I really don't. I just take a very selective. And so don't tell me is the guy who's going to like open so, the doors. And um, not, but, I'm going to jump in. Okay, so we have another question. Kelly asks, at what point in the process should you put together your sizzle wheel? This has been very helpful. Thank you. Um, what I again, okay, so let's say that you you have your book and you have a you have a clear you've got a clear vision of what you want to happen with your book. Series, feature film, you know, mini series, limited series. Because again, as I'm telling you, some of the, they're not buying certain things now. It doesn't mean they won't buy them next year. I mean, things change like they'll say there no one's gonna ever make a sports movie. Okay, then there's Bull Durham. And, then everybody's making sports movies. So Hollywood, they don't know anything. They just, they're all chasing their tails and uh, and worried about losing their jobs. Um, and so, you know, I don't want you to misconstrue what I'm saying. I'm just telling what the landscape is now, not what it's going to be, you know, by the summer come. So you decide, you've got your vision, you decide you have, you want to do that. If you want to work with Freddie, there's, you want to work with other editors. I, I work with a bunch of them. Freddie just happens to be the one who's my favorite and he does quick work and he's really good but you decide that you want to go that direction then you 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 go but you have to have a clear vision of what it is and and so you can tell us Freddie you, you know you can't just call him up and say here's my book I want a sizzle reel you have to be able to have that conversation and say listen this is what it's about these are what my characters are about this is what I want to say this is what's important and then you're into a dialogue with him and he will tell you honestly you know what he can do with it and what you need to do now he will usually he will usually ask you to write a script and some people like grace do it very well and some authors have a lot of trouble with that because the the the, the text becomes expository and and it, it's a different sort of craft i mean you know writing scripts is a craft writing books are a craft writing sizzle reels are a craft it's not doesn't often come that easy to everybody. So in that case, you know, you can ask Freddie to help you. He may charge you a little bit more. Um, you know, I am always available as a consultant um, if I'm available to help you with that. Um, I, I don't want to volunteer Jane, but Jane gets it. She understands the whole thing. You know, she she can help you or you find a find somebody who can sort of problem solve, you know, what what that is. Um, you could tell that both the Einstein Compass sizzle reel and the Phantom were both first-person storytelling. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, I've got a, I have another, I've got a number of sizzle reels that are not. And so, so you have to just make that choice um, of, of what you want to do. And you have to also be willing to realize, and more than anything, you have to be willing to lose the $3,000. You have to look at it that way. You have to look at it as I can take $3,000 and go to Vegas and gamble with it. And I'll be okay at the end of the weekend because I had fun and I went to Vegas and I knew I could lose, but I spent the $3,000. I saw some shows. I had fun with my spouse and, and, um, and, and, um, and I lost my money and I'm going to go home. Okay. You have to approach Hollywood the same way. You have to approach that like, I'm going to, I'm passionate about this. I'm willing to spend the money. I'm willing to do everything that I can possibly do. 
And I'm going to go into this knowing that I'm probably going to be unsuccessful with the hope that I am successful. And again, I have to tell you, even if you're unsuccessful on your first at bat, it doesn't mean that you won't come, it won't come around two years down, three years down the road. Your material doesn't change. Your book doesn't change. Your sizzle reel doesn't change. The climate will change. And once the climate has changed, now you have a different chance. As I said, I sold this project I tried 10 years ago, and that's happened a number of times with me where it's been unsuccessful on the first pass and things, executives get fired, new people come in. There's I'm, I'm going to jump in here. Rocky, uh, Christine has a question. Christine, I'm Grant. sorry if I'm being verbose. <laughs> Hi, um, this has been super. I've gotten so much great information. I really appreciate it. Um, real quickly, I had an unfortunate experience many years ago when I took a script writing class and uh, did the uh, character sketch the first act in the overview without doing the book first. The professor who worked for MGM Grand kept me after class for two hours while he took copious notes. And within a year, the Private Benjamin film came out, which was my story. And I was 21 years old, went into a TV series. So right. I'm like, so now I'm doing my memoirs because I've had um, an amazing life that I think would be in first person, very intriguing. The episodes are quite fascinating. And should I do a script writing? Should I, should I write a script, number one, or do that? Uh, just do the book. I, I definitely have to get copywritten. Now I'm paranoid about sharing any of my stories without having that being copywritten. And my other question is, this book here is based on, I ghostwrite people's love letters. I've done about 500 of them. My book's endorsed by John Gray and Catherine Woodward Thomas and all these luminaries. I think it would be a great series because it's all story and there's been so many movies uh, based on love letters. You know, right, well, you're, asking, you're asking a, a number, there are a number of questions. Yeah, I know, I know. I was just like, <laughs> I have okay. a client at so 2.30. I'll, I'll, I'll click them off, Pia. First of all, okay. I'm sorry you had that experience. I, in in 45 years of, of doing this, I've, I've never, I've only encountered it once with Warner Brothers and I, I sued them and I won. But it, it but it, it, that's that's one, one out of maybe a thousand projects that happened with. Um, today, the paper trail is much easier to, with emails and whatnot, you, you do. So I, I'm really sorry that happened to you. Um, second thing is writing the book or the screenplay. Um, that's the complete your call. I couldn't even advise you on that. Whatever you want to do is that's your call. Three is um, whether or not it's a series. In the, again, in this market, anthologies uh, are almost impossible to sell. I had one last year called Weird Women, uh, based on these you know writers who wrote you know monster characters back in the you know from Mary Shelley on all the way on these wonderful women who wrote, wrote incredible stories that you wouldn't expect would come from, you know, the female, even though that's, that's very misogynistic, but that's how Hollywood sort of looked at it. They're great writers. And so uh, anthologies are really not great, but, but fantastic <laughs> podcast. Mm -hmm. And if you do a podcast um, that is successful, that becomes valuable IP. So if you get a huge listenership on your podcast, if you're reading these letters and you're talking about it, then that might evolve into something else. You get it? Okay. Okay. And what about the budgets for films today? I know one of my songs was accepted to a Tarantino style movie uh, with Tara Reid and George Lopez. And every, I was all excited and everything. And then it was like, oh, they ran out of money. It's on hold. Okay, I can't. I, I I would I couldn't begin to answer you that because it's such a wide question. You know, it's like it's they're they're all over. I mean, well, you can go out and make a movie for you know five hundred thousand dollars if you have your own equipment and you you know everybody. You can make a movie for you know two hundred fifty million dollars if you you know they, they it just it just it depends. It's an impossible question to ask. What's the script? Who's going to be in the script? You know, how long is the shooting schedule? How many effects are involved with it? I mean, you know, you can you can go through you know uh, you know five hundred line items to get to a, to an answer to that. So I'm sorry. Okay. So, if there was any ever a way to get in touch with you after the show? Today? Yeah, I'll, I will take care of that, Christine. Okay. Thanks. Um, last question is: 
from Jim Simon. How much? Why the last question? I'm. Let's go. Come on. All right. Guys. All right. Whoa. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> how much different is a book trailer from a sizzle reel? Okay. Good question. Because I've done book trailers. Uh, they're re usually very simple. I mean, I've got a bunch of them. They're usually the graphics are relatively simple. Uh, the cost to make them are very simple. It's really someone a narration just telling you quickly what the story is about. Um, it's a nice. It's a nice. I guess the word addendum and, and, or a nice attachment to your Amazon thing like that, but it's not going to sell. It's not going to, it's not going to sizzle anybody to be interested in the, the next step of your project for the, for the most part. I mean, I, I have a, I did a book trailer. Um, I, unfortunately I didn't pull it up. I don't want to go look for it. I did a book trailer before I started doing sizzle reels, like on a, on a novel I wrote. Uh, I don't know, 15 years ago, and I, I, I was, the book was sexy enough and interesting enough that I could really put together something that was sort of cool. So it was a hybrid between the traditional book trailer and a sizzle reel, and it got me a deal. But it, but it was, it started out as sort of a book trailer, but I, I spiced, I spiced it up, a little, you know, quite a bit, uh, and but also by using footage from other, other media, to sort of tell my story. Um, okay. Uh, Donald has a question. He says, uh, log line, pitch deck, sizzle reel, verbal pitch. He said, he asks, am I missing one or two? Log line. Pitch deck. Reel, pitch deck. Sizzle reel, uh, verbal pitch. Am I missing something? I mean, that's the, that's the best part. I mean, as I said, synopsis, you know, again, going back to the old days, synopsis were, were used to send the synopsis in so somebody could just read it, you know, four pages of it on your book. And people don't want to read it all. It's just, it's just, I think it's a useless step for sales. For me, it's a very valuable step for an author to be able to synthesize their book into a couple of pages and then drill down from that to a couple of paragraphs and then drill down from that to a couple of lines. Um, I, I find that to be a very useful tool in get, teaching younger authors not chronologically younger, but authors who have not, you know, done this very much, this transition to actually start to understand how to tell their story. I mean, there's a lot of classes on the art of the pitch. I've taught them. Um, there's there, there are classes on how to adapt your own material uh, into from, to, from book to screenplay. I've taught them. Um, so there's all sorts of ways to go in, but yes, you have the general, the general um, four, I guess it's four, if I'm counting right. For me, sizzle reel is most important of all of them. So, okay. Does anybody else have any other questions for Rocky? So, um, before we leave, um, my friend Yolanda is here. Yolanda is an animation producer, and I don't think we have time today. We're really way over. So, I think I'll set up another call if anybody has an animation project and see if there's interested in talking to Yolanda. So um, we will do that another day. Uh, Rocky, um, I'm gonna send everybody an email uh, on how you can get in touch with Rocky. And if you wanna consult with him, that's fine. Um, everything will be in the letter and um, that's it. By the way, um, oh, you're welcome, Sarah. Just FYI, uh, if you've been here before, you know I'm not, selling anything uh but i will tell you i have my second annual book cover awards if you have not joined us you really need to because the prizes are insane everybody will be promoted on on our bedside reading um social media platforms so if you are interested in submitting your book for the book cover awards it's bedside reading i'm going to put it right in here this is my little pitch uh, enter 2023. So go ahead and if you're interested in joining us. Um, so thank you, everybody. And if anybody has one last thing to say to Rocky, um, go I have for one it, last Rocky. thing to say. I want, I want to tell all of you that um, when I was a kid and I wanted to be a film director, my dad um, made me start at the very bottom and experience every asset uh every, every aspect of filmmaking from bat putting battery packages together to 
you know, sweeping the floor, learning lenses, learning distribution, all of that, and to take acting classes, so forth and so on. And writing sort of came to me later and a little bit later in the process. And I just want to say to you that anybody who faces a blank page, and that's all of you, who create something out of nothing um, that never existed in the history of the world before and will never exist again, you have to be proud of yourself for that for that effort because ultimately the process is as important as the result. But we're in a, we're in such a result oriented world that we sometimes feel that we have failed because our books or our movies don't get made or they are not as successful as we we had dreams about them. But don't be that way. <laughs> you know, give yourself a pat on the back for the effort. You know, as I say, right on. Thank you. Okay, so everybody, I'm going to send everybody an email um, on how to contact Rocky um, and a reminder um, of that. I'm going to talk to Yolanda and see if we can pull together um, a webinar about how to get your animated your projects made. And if that's of interest, you'll let me know. And thank you, everybody, for taking the time to show up and uh, be here. And I appreciate the Bedside Reading community. So Thanks, Jane. thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jane. Jane, and we'll have so this much. recording available. So uh, I'm not even going to edit out our little <laughs> glitches here. It is what it is. This is authenticity, right? <laughs> thank you. OK, thanks so much. OK, we'll talk soon. OK, everybody. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, thank everybody. you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Rocky. Thanks, Jane. OK, my pleasure. Thanks, everybody. OK, Bye -bye. take care.